Hey, what's up, guys? So I thought I'd give some quick thoughts on last night's fight between Tyson Fury and Otto Valin. Of course, I'll go into more detail tomorrow night on my show, The Neutral Corner, right here on this very channel, 7 p.m. Eastern Time. But, uh, so look, there was good, there was bad, there was ugly last night. And I can't just talk about the good, the puff piece, okay? Let's start with the good, though. Here's the good. We got a much better fight than expected. It was much more competitive than the odds makers had it, than most of us thought it would be. We saw new wrinkles to Tyson Fury's game that were impressive. He made adjustments. He fought on the inside. He showed that he could think late. He once again survived a shaky last round where he was hurt. He showed some heart, some grit, some determination. And I thought he was very, very classy after the fight. Otto Valin had gotten a little dirty in there with him. He was, you know, not really thumbing his eye, but there was a, one part where he kind of got his glove up in it and was pushing up on it and stuff. Um, it was nasty in there. And F Fury was really, really cool post-fight and, and gave Valin props for being so competitive, sent blessings to his deceased father, who Valin was, you know, of course, very close with. And they had a dream of fighting you know, in America in a big top fight like this. And he wasn't able to share that dream with his father. And Fury knew about that. And he just talked about it a little bit. And I just thought he was really classy after the fight. And it just showed a, a part of his personality that is why people like Tyson Fury and why he kind of promotes himself, right? So all of that, <clears throat> that's the good. It brings me to this lineal nonsense, which a lot has been made about it. And I've been trolling and having a little fun with it myself on my channel, on my Twitter feed. But it really is beyond ridiculous. And some people out there are, are going in real hard with this whole lineal made-up title thing that ESPN, and this is a directive from Top Rank, their partner, because uh, Top Rank's doing it as well. Just pushing this whole lineal, lineal, lineal thing can you think of a time when ESPN or any other network, any other bro broadcast crew platform has pushed this hard, has pushed this much propaganda for one particular fighter trying to legitimize them as a champion? I can't think of it. And specifically to ESPN, they've never used the term lineal. You guys got to remember, ESPN did Friday Night Fights and they did plenty of boxing before this deal with top rank that started in recent years. They had, they've done boxing forever. And I can't think of any fight, any championship fight, where they constantly talked about lineal, lineal, lineal. And, or any other promoter using it as much as top ranks using it with Tyson Fury. Somebody somewhere at the top made the decision that this is how we're going to push this dude. And it, it comes off like this, okay? I'm not a conspiracy theory guy, but it comes off this way. That... The folks involved, the commentary crew, every, even the writers at ESPN, everyone's been told you can say these things, but these things over here are off limits. We're not going to talk about this stuff. We're only going to focus and push this stuff. Here's the narrative. Here's how we're promoting this guy. It comes off very forced when every single member of the commentary crew, not just the blow-by-blow -blow guys last night, but even Max Kellerman and the guys way up at the top of the bowl there in the, uh, the arena in Las Vegas, said the word lineal multiple times during the broadcast. Can you think of any other fight, any other fighter, any other broadcast in recent times where the, the commentary crew and the promoter have pushed the WBA title, the IBF title, whatever title it was, a hundred plus times during the show. I can't think of one. Could you imagine if the last time, I don't know, Deontay Wilder fought, I think it was on Showtime, Brazil, and that only lasted a round. But imagine a Deontay Wilder fight on Showtime or Fox where they said WBC heavyweight champion over a hundred times, every single member of the commentary crew, they kept shoving that down your throat. That's what ESPN is doing with with. Uh, Tyson Fury and his lineal thing. And it's just ridiculous. The thing is, they don't have to do it. Tyson Fury promotes himself. Did you see that ring walk last night? It was hilarious. It wasn't as good as his ring walk for Tom Schwartz. 
but it was still a lot of fun. It was entertaining. And then everything I said about Tyson Fury, what he showed in the ring, fighting with the cut, making adjustments, being classy after the fight and giving his opponent so much credit when a lot of other guys out there would have talked a lot of shit. That's enough. And Joe Testator and the guys on the crew there at ESPN, that's all. They could have just talked about that. They could have just talked about what was happening in the ring instead of pushing this narrative that feels very, very forced and disingenuous, right? There was almost no talk about Tyson Fury, a guy who's six foot eight, 250 plus pounds, a big, big man, being so nimble and fighting on the inside. When's the last time we've seen a heavyweight fight on the inside like that? No talk about that. No talk about the fact that he was making adjustments and coming forward and leaning on Wallen, Wallen, and that's what wore him down. No talk about the fact that Fury's switch up in tactics pretty much nullified everything, everything Wallen wanted to do from the seventh round through 11th rounds. Otto Wallin didn't land one significant punch where he planted his feet and put some weight into it. Not one. It took until the 12th round when he actually landed something and hurt Fury. No talk about the fact that Fury was being advised to move to his right, the eye, or the, the right eye was the one that was cut, and lean to his right and covering up and shelling up. He was doing an outstanding job of that, okay? They did talk about the cut man. Javier Capetillo did a really, really good job. But they weren't talking about the tactics and what we were seeing in the ring. They were making it sound like we were watching an all-time great fight. Max Kellerman, after the fight, said that this was on par with Joshua Klitschko or Lewis Klitschko. It wasn't. And they were talking about um, the first Wilder Fury fight being on par with those fights. Excuse me. It wasn't. It wasn't that great of a fight. It was tense and there was a couple of exciting moments, but it wasn't a very good fight. Tyson Fury barely threw 300 punches against Deontay Wilder. Remember, this is a 12-round fight, okay? So, just the propaganda, they're trying so hard to push something that you don't need to push. This, there's enough story there. There's enough intrigue there without all this extra bullshit. And talking about the commentary crew, on top of all the lineal stuff and, and pushing this narrative, glancing over all the bad stuff and just pushing this good, feel-good stuff, there was a moment in that fight where Tyson Fury obviously was cut and his corner was unaware that it was from a punch. And if you watch the fight again, immediately after the cut, Tyson Fury, there was really no sense of urgency. He was fine. He knew he was cut, but he was still very, very calm. And it was Joe Tessitore who said, wow, they don't know in that corner that this, this cut was caused by a punch. And I'm paraphrasing, okay? I'm not quoting. Get over there and talk to them and see if they know. And then Bernardo Suda goes over there, talks to him, and lets the corner know, hey, this wasn't caused by a headbutt. This was caused by a punch. So if this fight stopped, you guys lose. And all of a sudden... Once Fury was made aware of that in his corner, you saw an immediate sense of urgency come from him, right? I think it was the seventh round where he came out guns blazing and looked completely different in the second half of that fight than he had looked in some of the earlier rounds where even though he was cut, he was taking his time, right? So you having the broadcast crew influence a fight like that, I can't think of any other time that's happened to that degree. It's not supposed to go that way. That is the commission's job to make the corner aware. And Jack Reese, the, the referee, I'm sorry, it wasn't Jack Reese. The, the referee made it pretty clear that it was from a punch. I can't, I can't remember the name of the ref. Made it clear that it was from a punch. And if, if Tyson Fury's corner didn't get that message or whatever, that's on them. But the commission is supposed to make everybody aware of what's going on, not the broadcast crew. You're not supposed to influence a fight if you're the commentary people. You're supposed to just commentate on the fight. You can ask questions, you can interview, but you're not supposed to influence the fight. It's the same thing with a ref. We don't want a ref to disproportionately influence a fight. Now, I can think of a few fights recently where a ref gave a fighter instructions or advice that looked strange and biased. I can think of examples like that, but an actual commentary crew doing it, I can't think of a time we've seen that in a fight like this in recent memory. Uh, you know, Comparing the ESPN guys 
And the Fox guys, PBC, and I know Showtime's still slightly involved. They're hanging out by a thread. But when you think PBC going forward, you should think Fox because that's, that's where that train's going. And then the zone with everybody else. There's kind of this three-headed monster right now. And none of our commentary crews are perfect. No commentary crew is ever going to be perfect. All of them have their sort of propaganda that they push. I mean, the PBC won't even list Terrence Crawford as a top welterweight. He doesn't even exist. They won't list or rate WBO champions because Bob Arum and Top Rank slash ESPN, they do a lot of business with the WBO. So there's politics involved there with PBC and their push. You can say there's some similar things about the zone, although I, don't, I think they're the best about it. They seem to rate everybody. But I can't, right now, man, the ESPN crew, and I hate to say this because I really like Joe Tessitore. I've actually met him before. He's a nice guy. I've met these dudes that work at ESPN. I know a lot of them. I'm friends with some of them. But the, the narrative over there, the propaganda, it is the worst right now of all the, of the three-headed monster. ESPN is the worst. And it's all centered on Tyson Fury. They don't go this hard with Lomachenko. They don't go this hard with Terrence Crawford. For whatever reason, I guess because he's a heavyweight and they want that big payout with the Deontay Wilder rematch, that fight sells itself. They don't need to push this hard. But also, I got to add this, PBC is slightly involved with this because they want to mention the lineal thing so that when Wilder beats Fury in the rematch, they get to claim he's the lineal champion. So there is an element there of them kind of being cool with it. But the commentary crew at ESPN, dude, man, it just comes off very, very disingenuous, as I've said before. And for the conspiracy theorists out there, it gives them energy. It gives them food and fuel for their fire. Let me see here. I'm just looking at some notes I put down, man. Um, I talked about Fury doing a very, very good job protecting that cut. And that's what the commentary crew should have been talking about. Um, Aldo Valin, let's talk about him. After that fight, the ESPN crew is making it sound like Aldo Valin has proven himself as a top 10 heavyweight. That he's, you know, suddenly now a top level heavyweight. No, he's not. He's still not a top 10 heavyweight. You can't tell me, based, and this is no disrespect to Aldo Valin. This was the fight of his life. And you could see it in his eyes. He was not going to back down. Fury landed some pretty big shots and... He held on. He was going to go the distance, and he was going to give it his all, and he truly did. But he had his man hurt in the 12th round. He had his man badly cut for eight-plus rounds, I believe, and simply could not follow up on it. And it wasn't for a lack of effort, a lack of heart. He really wanted to. He just couldn't. And you can't tell me, based on what you saw last night, that Otto Valin beats guys like Kubrat Pulev, Joseph Parker, Luis Ortiz... Even like Derek Chisora, guys at that Even some of these prospects like Daniel Dubois, uh, I think would beat him. I, obviously, Ruiz and Joshua and all those guys, I think would beat him. He's maybe a top 15 heavyweight right now. Maybe. He's, he's right in that wheelhouse. I'm not so sure he beats Dominic Brazil. I would probably favor Dominic Brazil to beat Otto Valin. That'd be a fun fight. That'd be a fun fight. I'd like to see him fight Derek Chisora, any of those guys. That'd be fun, but he's not up there in the top 10 right now off this fight. But ESPN had to kind of push it that way. They had to kind of push that narrative to keep Tyson Fury propped up. Right now, Otto Valin, because of this performance, he has earned another payday. He's earned more exposure on a network, whether it's ESPN or somewhere else. Not the main event, but exposure on a big card, or maybe he's the co-main or something like that. Uh, I'd like to see him, it, again, against any of those top 15, you know, that lower tier of the top 10, 15 level heavyweights. I think those would be fun fights. But he's going to come up short in most of those fights. He just doesn't have it. He got lucky with that cut, and it influenced and affected the fight. And he seized this moment as well as he could. But you can't tell me, man, that if it was Joseph Parker in there who got that cut, or a clean Dillian White... Or even Luis Ortiz with his blood pressure medication and everything else. Those guys probably could have, may have capitalized last night. Valin just couldn't. He's not at that level. So regardless of what ESPN tells you, he's not even a top 10 heavyweight. 
Why do I mention all this? Because him going the distance with Tyson Fury, now people are starting to have 2020 hindsight. Now that it's a little safer, and you're going to start seeing people come out and say, you know what, Fury's going to, or I'm sorry, Wilder is going to destroy Fury in the rematch. Or, you know, maybe Fury isn't the number one heavyweight in the world. Now you're starting to hear those whispers, right? Because it's safe. They couldn't say it before last night. That's how these things work. Guys like me would put it out there before. We'd take shit for it. Now everyone that was talking shit is suddenly quiet. Well, styles make fights. Anything can happen in the ring. And just because Otto Valin went 12 rounds with Tyson Fury doesn't mean Tyson Fury got exposed. At least not in my eyes. If you rated Tyson Fury the super duper heavyweight champion and he's the greatest thing since Joe Lewis, maybe he got exposed a little bit in your eyes last night if you bought into ESPN's propaganda. But as far as I see it, Fury is one of the top heavyweights in the world. You can make an argument he's number one, number two. You could also make an argument he's number three or number four, depending on what you're looking at and what you rate, which criteria is important to you. But he's still largely unproven. What do I mean by that? His entire shtick as the guy, right, that ESPN's pushing is based off one fight in 2015 against Vladimir Klitschko. I'm not even going to get into all the stuff that was going on before that fight and everything that happened subsequent to that fight. It was over four, year, four years ago, basically. Almost four years ago. I believe it was late 2015. So you're talking almost four years ago. Your entire legacy is built off this one fight, and then you had a draw with Deontay Wilder last year, another largely unproven heavyweight. Anthony Joshua is still proving himself. Andy Ruiz has a lot to prove. Yes, he just beat Joshua. Can you follow up on it, or was it a fluke? All of these guys still have something to prove. They're all flawed. They all have interesting, good qualities and tangibles about them that are different and unique. They're all different walk and talk kind of guys from different corners of the world, different walks of life. They all bring a different element into the ring, different skill set, different strengths, and different weaknesses. None of them has separated themselves as the top guy. And that's good. It's not a bad thing. We don't need ESPN to push so hard. Why? Let it play out. Get these guys to fight each other and let the fighting do the talking for you. Because with all these guys' flaws, with all the vulnerability and the unique skill set each one of them brings, as they all fight and we get a round-robin thing, hopefully, going on over the next few years, man, we're going to have some exciting times in this division. It's great that there's no top guy right now, that they all have to prove it. The last generation, it wasn't this exciting because you had one guy who was so dominant and I'm not even going to talk about Klitschko's style, Vladimir Klitschko's style, but just he was so dominant over the division. It was a pre-gone conclusion every time he fought someone. He fought any top guy that was willing, but there was a few of the top guys who ducked him and had wanted no piece of him. But it was kind of boring because it was one story on and on and on for like a whole decade. And now you got guys losing, taking L's, getting cut, almost taking an L, right? It's exciting, man. That's enough. We don't need made up titles. We don't need this propaganda bullshit. Let these dudes fight. I mentioned Deontay Wilder. It's going to be interesting to see when he fights Luis Ortiz a second time. That fight's supposed to happen in late November. It could even be early December. They still haven't announced it. I have no idea what the hell PBC is doing here. They're really blowing it. They're going to take a bath on that fight. They took a bath on the Brazil fight. They're banking on making their money back with that Fury rematch. Anyway, there's a measuring stick there. We get to see what Deontay Wilder learned in those 12 rounds against Tyson Fury. Because the first Ortiz fight was before the Fury fight, right? He struggled, almost knocked out at one point, came back, wins by knockout. How does he look the second time around? After going those 12 rounds with Fury and having something to learn from, finally facing an elite-level opponent, a healthy elite-level opponent in their physical prime in, in, in regards to what age they were. He's going to learn from that, I feel. And he's going to show up against Luis Ortiz and dominate that fight. Maybe he'll lose a round. But he's pretty much going to control it, 
fight smart. It might go later. It could maybe even go the distance if, if Deontay just fights smart behind the jab. But my sense is that he's eventually going to break down and stop Ortiz without getting hurt this time. And he's going to look better. When I look at that first fight between Wilder and Fury, people keep talking about the fact that Fury wasn't 100% because he was coming back and he hadn't fought a top-level fighter. And yada, yada, yada. I get it. I get it. There is some logic to that. But no one's talking about the fact that Deontay Wilder was taking a quantum leap in opposition. His resume before that fight was stir-fried shit. And Fury, his resume outside of the Klitschko fight was stir-fried shit, but there was that Klitschko fight. In those 12 rounds he spent with Vladimir Klitschko, that experience on the road against an all-time great, a fight that he won by nullifying what Vlad wanted to do. He learned from that and that experience he brought that into the ring against Wilder, and it's what got him through. Now, Wilder finally has, after 40 some odd professional fights, has 12 rounds of experience against a top elite level heavyweight, and that is Tyson Fury. I don't rate Luis Ortiz as high as other people do. I think he's a little overrated. Wilder learned from that fight, sure, but the 12 rounds with Tyson Fury, I think that made him a better fighter. And I think he's going to destroy, dominate Ortiz in that rematch. And I've felt this way all along. He's going to beat Fury in the rematch. I've said that all along. It's not, I'm not just saying this now because Fury struggled a little bit with Otto Valin last night. I've been saying it on my show for about a year. I just feel that Wilder is going to learn more and make more adjustments in that second fight. I think Fury did pretty much everything he could do the first time around. And yes, he was dropped a couple times. Man, he was stunned against Otto Valin last night, who can't punch through a wet paper bag. There are seriously super middleweights, light heavyweights that punch harder than Otto Valin. He's just not a hard puncher. So the cut was a lucky thing. That was more about angles. But the fact that he was able to hurt Fury late in that fight, such a fe feather-fisted heavyweight. And again, no disrespect, it's just the reality. Look at how Valin punches. He very rarely gets full extension. He doesn't step into it. His legs and his ass, his back are not into his punches. It's 100% arm punches. It's all arm punches. So if he's able to buzz Fury, I just think Wilder is going to be able to get it done. And also, let's talk about the cut. That cut is multi-layered. It cut through multiple... Multiple layers of skin were lacerated with that cut, right? So you're not just going to get one row of stitches. It's going to be layers of stitches. It was very reminiscent of Vitaly Klitschko's cut against Lennox Lewis. The only difference is Lennox Lewis was able to capitalize on it and target the cut. Valin wasn't able to do that. And Fury was able to get away from the punches. Vitaly Klitschko wasn't. Vitaly Klitschko just wasn't defensively as good as Tyson Fury is. Uh, head movement and everything just not on Fury's level. So Lewis was able to keep busting that cut up. Valin was able to do a little bit of that, but it, and enough of that to where there's multiple layers of skin busted up, right? So they're going to have to do multiple layers of stitches. That's going to require months of, of healing and rehab and all that good stuff. However, who's to say that one stiff, hard jab from Deontay Wilder doesn't bust that thing right back open in the earlier middle rounds of their rematch next year could very well happen. And if that happens then, believe me, Wilder's going to be able to capitalize on that and follow up on it. For my money right now, I think it goes the distance again, that rematch. This time, Wilder wins it. Uh, I got to add this too. One of you guys made this point on Twitter, and it's a fair point. If Deontay Wilder had struggled with Otto Valin, got cut, got hurt, and barely survived that 12th round. I shouldn't say barely survived, but clearly was buzzed and had trouble and gave up three, four rounds to Otto Valin. There'd be a lot of people talking shit. Now, in fairness, there'd be a lot of people, the PBC guys who, you know, there's some credentialed media guys with them and some of the PBC fan guys would be trying to prop up Otto Valin the same way ESPN is. They'd be trying to do that too. But there'd also be an element on Twitter bashing the shit out of Deontay Wilder and saying he was exposed, yada, yada, yada. Let, let's be fair. There is a double standard here. And it just depends on who you talk to. 
My thing is to be fair and objective and call out all the bullshit on all sides. Enjoy and, and you know, talk about the positives as well, but call out the other shit because that exists too. Give the whole damn story. So let me see. Did I hit everything? I think I hit everything, man. I think I hit everything. So again, we'll talk more about this in detail. What am I forgetting? Is there anything I'm forgetting? Comment below and let's get the conversation started and let's continue it tomorrow evening on the Neutral Corner Boxing Podcast. I'll see you at the fights. Flying out to Los Angeles next week. Going to be there covering Spence Porter. Can't wait. It's going to be great. For all my peeps there in the Los Angeles area, let's get up and have a beer and talk some boxing. And I'll see you at that fight for real. In the meantime, let's talk some more Fury Volley.